Welcome everybody to Calculus BC. In today's episode, we will be reviewing derivative applications. So in Calculus AB, you learned a bunch of derivative applications. You learned that uh, derivative, use, finding a derivative is akin to finding a formula to find rate of change of a function, finding the slope of a function, but who cares? Why do we care about how a function grows? Why do we care about how a function behaves? One of the consequences of learning about how a function behaves is it allows us to figure out certain values on the function using what's called a linear style of approximation. Sometimes we can figure out how far up and how far down a function will actually go by using the first derivative to uh, find out mins and uh, a minimum and maximum values on that function. We can not only determine if a function is increasing or decreasing, but we can also determine how that function is increasing or decreasing. We can figure out if that function is increasing at a decreasing rate like this, or increasing at an increasing rate like this. Uh, similar for decreasing, we learned how to determine how fast an oil patch was expanding as long as it was in a circle. We learned how to find out how fast that thing was expanding at a certain point in time. You remember those as related rate problems. We also learned how to figure out the largest box possible so that we could fit the most, the most volume inside or the, a certain amount of volume inside while minimizing its surface area. You guys remember that as optimization. And in this video, we will be reviewing as many of those things as we can. So buckle up everybody, let's get ready to rock and roll with some calculus AB review of derivative applications. And the first one I'm gonna start off with is number 10. And that it and it reads, find an approximate value of this function here. So y equals the square root of four plus sine x, and they want it at x equals 0 0.12. And they want me to use the tangent line of the graph at x equals zero. Okay, so what is this question even asking me to do? Well, at the end of the day, what they're asking me to do is they're asking me, hey, what is f of 0 0.12 approximately? In other words, what is the approximate value of 4 plus sine of 0 0.12? What is this? Well, without a calculator, it's going to be really hard for me to figure it out. However, I can use a linear approximation to, uh, to as close as I can, guess what that value is uh, pretty much going to be. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this point right here. This point that they gave to me is going to serve two purposes. This zero is not only super close to the number that they want me to guess, but also if I plug that zero in for x into sine, I get something clean out of that expression right there. And so uh, let's go and find out exactly what that is. If I plug in zero, right, that means I have coordinates zero comma something. Well, if I take sine of zero, right, sine of zero, well, that's zero. And then plus four underneath the radical is just rad four, so that gives me a y coordinate of two. So these two coordinates right here, this coordinate pair, I will now use this to write the beginnings of the equation of a tangent line. And in the last video, we wrote the equation of a tangent line, so I told you I would write the shell of it, and then I am now missing the slope and I find slope by taking the derivative. Before I begin that though, it might be beneficial, especially if you, you know, haven't thought about calculus in a long time, to just kind of go back to basics and call that four plus sine x to the one half power. It helps you see the power rule better. It helps you see the chain rule better. So I'm gonna say y prime is equal to one half parentheses, inside stays unchanged. Again, I'm doing chain rule here. So I hope you guys can appreciate that chain rule, product rule, these all just show up randomly in problems here, and, and it's expected that you know uh, that, that, that they're there. And so because I just derived the outer, the outer shell of the function, now the inner shell is going to be a cosine of x for chain rule. So ordinarily, I tend to not simplify my derivatives, but in this case, they're asking me to do something with it. So I think it might not be a bad idea for me to simplify this derivative here. So I have just found a formula to find slope anywhere, but I don't want the slope anywhere. I want the slope at x equals not 0 0.12. Okay, do not plug 0 0.12 into here. All right, I know what you're thinking. You know, we've got to use that 0 0.12, and we will use him later. But if I, but if you think of it this way, 
If I had to use 0.12, I'd have to plug it in for cosine of x and sine of x. And if I knew what sine of 0.12 is, I wouldn't have a need to do this function here. I wouldn't have a need to do linear approximation. I would just tell them exactly what they're looking for. So I'm gonna take the derivative and plug in zero. This is the point, again, closest to the number in question and comes out clean when I plug it in. So let's get something clean out of this. Y prime at zero is gonna be cosine of zero over two rad four plus sine of zero. Well, sine of zero is nothing and cosine of zero is one, so that's one over two rad four. Rad four is two. So I'm getting a slope of one fourth right here. So one fourth goes in as my slope in my equation of my tangent line. So now that I've got my equation of my tangent line, now the 0.12 is going to play a role. Remember, this is called linear approximation. So I will plug my 0.12 into the line, into the line right here. So what I have is y minus two equals one fourth times 0.12. And let's go and find out what this is. This is gonna be one fourth times, I'm gonna call them 12, oops, 12 over, looks like if I move them over twice, 12 over 100, right, equals, uh, I'll go with y here and I'll go and throw it on a two right there. So this might help me out a little bit. This is going to kind of cancel. I'm gonna get three over 100 plus, I'm gonna say 200 over 100 on common denominator, hoping we all remember that. So y equals 203 over 100, 2.03. And I believe that is one of the options in this multiple choice section. So what this is basically saying is that if you did this in a calculator, you would get about 2.03, hopefully, and you will. So hopefully the linear approximation makes a little bit of sense. I'll be right back with the next derivative application problem. Number 25 says, given the function defined by f of x, equals 3x to the fifth minus 20x cubed. They want me to find all values of x for which the graph of f is concave up. So we're looking for concave up intervals. So from calculus AB, you should have a pretty good reflex at this point. Something in your brain should be triggering. When you see the word concave up or concave down or even points of inflection, the tool that is, that is best for this problem here is, well, it's the only tool, it's the second derivative. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the second derivative by first taking the first derivative. So that's gonna be 15x to the fourth minus 60x squared. Gotta derive it again. So f double prime of x, is gonna be, looks like 60 x to the third minus 120 x. At this point in time, I'm gonna go and factor out a GCF here. So I'm gonna go 60 x. I believe that's going to get me x squared minus two. And I'm gonna set that equal to zero now. So what are my critical numbers? Well, my critical numbers are gonna be zero and plus or minus the square root of two. Now, the way we determine concave up and concave down is we punch in a sign chart. And it's been a while since you've seen one of these things, but I'm hoping that, um, that's a negative rad two there, uh, but I'm hoping that this will kind of jar your memory a little bit. The two numbers that, oh, the two functions that serve in this sign chart are gonna be 60x and x squared minus two. Now, I might do this a little bit differently than what you remember, but if you look at 60x, he's a line. His Critical number would be zero, where he turns zero. He's an upward facing line, which means anything before zero will be negative, anything after zero will be positive. X squared minus two is a parabola, that's upward facing. His roots or his zeros are negative rad two and rad two. And since he's upward facing, the outsides of him will be positive and the insides of him will be negative. These two interact via multiplication because they do here. So that's gonna be minus plus minus plus, and they're looking for concave up intervals. So I'm looking at this interval and this interval right here. So what I'm looking at is between negative rad two to zero, union rad two to infinity. And that's where your function is concave up. All right, let's take a look at the next problem here under our derivative applications. Let's check out problem number 29. The problem reads, the area of a circular region is increasing at a rate of 96 pi square meters per second. 
when the area of the region is 64 pi square meters, how fast in meters per second is the radius of the region increasing? Now, whether you know how to do this problem or not, you should be recognizing this thing full face as a related rate problem. Uh, related rate problems are definitely part of the AP exam. I'm sure you'll see one on yours this year. Uh, don't be threatened by it. It's not that bad. We're going to break down the problem, and as I read, I'm going to tell myself to stop because I've said something important. So it reads again. The area of a circular region is increasing at a rate of 96 square meters per second. I'm going to stop right there because the way a related rate problem's rhythm works is they always give you a rate, and then they want a rate back at a, at a given point in time. So the fact they're telling me that the area is increasing at a rate of 96 pi means that they're giving me dA over dt, and that's going to be 96 pi. So that's one piece of information that I think is going to be important in this problem here. It says, when the area of the region is 64 pi square meters, how fast in meters per second, here comes the rate that they want from me, how fast in meters per second is the radius of the region increasing? So what they want from me, what they want, is they want dr over dt. And it seems like previously in the problem, they seem to want that when the area is 64 pi. So it, once I establish the rate that they gave me and the rate that they want from me, it's up to me to figure out that relationship that's going to bring all these things together. Well, since they're talking about the area of a circular region, my guess is that the relationship is A equals pi r squared. Now, given the fact that there are no miscellaneous or extra variables going on here, I think I'm ready to derive this thing. And remember, in a related rate problem, we always derive things with respect to time. So every, each side gets a d over dt, which is why the derivative of a is dA over dt equals the 2 is going to come down from power rule 2 pi r. But don't forget, just like an implicit differentiation, dr over dt is going to uh, chain out on that derivative. So what do we know so far? We know that dA dt is equal to 96 pi. I believe they told us this at the beginning of the problem. Equals 2 pi some type of r and then a dr over dt. Well, the problem is, is what the heck is this thing here? Well, that looks like a 2, but it's really a question mark. Um, so notice how they want this information when a equals 64 pi. Well, I feel like we can go back to the original equation here, or the original formula a equals pi r squared. We know that at the exact moment in time, we know that 64 pi is our area in question. So that's going to be equal to pi r squared. Well, I think this formula is going to be how I find the radius at that point in time as well. The pi's are going to cancel each other out. r squared equals 64. Take the square root on either side, r equals 8. And that is what goes into here. So now from here, what I'm going to get is I'm going to divide out the pi's. I'm going to go and divide out uh, the 2 on either side. So I get 48 equals 8 dr dt. Now, of course, you could have divided out 16. No problem here. Uh, and done it a little bit faster than me. But either way, you get dr dt equaling 6. Now, at this point, on a multiple choice, you would circle the answer. However, we will expect you to uh, write a statement at the end saying something to the effect of the radius is increasing at a rate of 6. I'll go and move that down. That way, it's easier to read. In this case, six meters, not six square meters, right? Because, whoops, because we are talking about a linear uh, measure, six meters per second. And we always want to say when that's happening if it's available. So that's going to be when the area equals 64. And I'll go and draw in the pi in just a second because there is no pi typing tool here in the program. So it'll be when a equals 64 pi. And that's going to be feet squared. So there you have it. There's a related rate problem. Uh, I will be back with the next problem in just a second. All right, let's get ready for number 65 here. The problem reads, what is the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in the ellipse 4x squared plus 9y squared equals 36? So they're talking about the largest rectangle that can be inscribed inside of this ellipse here. So I'm going to go ahead and actually write this in a different way. I'm going to divide everything by 36. And I'm going to get, uh, looks like x squared over 9 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. Just to give you guys a visual. Now, it's not super important that you graph it, but I think um, it's good to know when you can. 
So we've got uh, an ellipse here that's uh, two up, two down, three left, three right, so what they want, and that was supposed to actually make contact, and I apologize that it did not, uh, but they want the largest rectangle that can be drawn like that, more or less. So from here, this should stand out full face like the last problem. Unlike related rates, this one's optimization. And so they want the largest rectangle. So it looks like they want me to optimize. They want me to optimize area. So I better find a way to find out the area of this rectangle. So from here, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to go out this much, and I'm going to go out this much. And I know that this is x on either side. And then if I go up a certain amount and I go down a certain amount, I know that that's y. So I know now that my area is going to be 2x times 2y to find the area of this rectangle. In other words, a equals 4xy. And this is the thing that I'm going to be optimizing right here. This is the thing that I'm going to be taking the derivative of, except right now, as it stands, I've got too many variables here, way too many variables. So I need to find a way to get rid of one because we're dealing it only in single variable calculus right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a way to do a variable replacement. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to go back to this original formula here. Or I could go back to the one that I modified, but I don't think I will. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get one of the variables by itself. I'll just go ahead and get the uh, y by itself because I like things in terms of x. It's kind of my style. So I hope you don't mind. I'm going to just say 9y squared equals 36 minus 4x squared. And that should be uh, good enough. I just subtracted 4x from either side. I'm going to go and divide everything by 9. Now I'm going to divide the individual pieces by 9 because I'm going to reduce what I can. So y squared equals, looks like 4 minus 4 ninths x squared. And I'm going to square root either side. And I'm going to get y equals technically plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 4 ninths x squared. Now technically it is plus or minus, but I really only need one of them. I only need the positive version because really I'm just going to try and find the values of x and y that optimize the rectangle inside. So I won't need the negative version in order to figure that part out. Uh, from here I can actually find the constraints of my function or I could use the graph to find the constraints of the function. The constraints of the function will be from negative 3 to 3, right? And because it goes out as far as 3 and as far, uh, as far to the right as 3. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and say that a no longer equals xy. a equals x parentheses 4 minus 4 ninths x squared to the 1 half power. And now the calculus of the problem can begin. So let's go ahead and take the derivative here. So what, what, what rules do I see? I see product and chain rule happening. So dA over dx equals, and this is going to get kind of nasty, but it's going to be first unchanged times the derivative of the second, so 4 minus 4 ninths x squared to the negative 1 half times, the 4 is going to go away, but I'm going to have a negative 8 ninths x. So that's first unchanged times the derivative of the second. I'm going to move the screen over just a little bit here, plus second unchanged. So that's going to be 4 minus 4 ninths x squared to the positive 1 half times 1 for the derivative of the first. So now that the calculus is done, let's go ahead and simplify what we can. Remember, I, I tend to not simplify derivatives unless I'm going to do something to them, and this time I am. So the 2 and the negative 8 can kind of cancel each other out, as well as the x's multiplying. So what am I seeing here? I'm seeing negative 4 over 9 x squared, parentheses, 4 minus 4 ninths x squared to the negative 1 half. Plus, again, the right side didn't seem to have, uh, the right, uh, right of the uh, plus sign didn't seem to have much going on with it. So from here, I'm going to go and factor out. So what can I factor out of this expression here? So what I'm seeing here is I'm going to factor out a 4 minus 4 ninths x squared to the negative 1 half. And what that gives me is it gives me negative 4 ninths x squared on the inside. This guy is going to go away, but it gives me plus 4 minus 4 ninths x squared to the first power. Hopefully that makes sense. And now from here, these guys will combine out. Unfortunately, they don't cancel. But what I'm going to get is I'm going to get 4 minus 8 ninths x squared 
over the square root. I'm actually going to go ahead and bring this dude down. 4 minus 4 ninths x squared. And that is my derivative. So I'll give you a second to kind of copy that down. So from here, we've got to find some critical numbers. I'm hoping it makes sense that plus or minus 3 would work here because that would make the 4s turn to 0. But that's okay. We're not going to plug those in because that would make the derivative undefined anyway. The top, I'm going to go ahead and set equal to 0 manually, and we're going to solve uh, because I don't want to be doing that in my head. I'm going to add that guy to both sides. So I got 4 equals 8 ninths x squared. I'm going to go ahead and multiply him over. So I got 36 over 8 equals x squared. So now what I'm going to do is I'm not going to reduce, but I am going to, I'm going to go ahead and say that x equals plus or minus the square root of 36 over the square root of 8. Now I actually am going to reduce these numbers because I feel like they're doable. So I'm going to get plus or minus 6 over the square root of 8 is 2 rad 2. So those guys will cancel. So I have plus or minus 3 over rad 2 equaling my critical numbers for x. So how does this help me? Well, my derivative will get plugged into a sign chart here, which will be negative 3 over rad 2 and positive 3 over rad 2. Now what's good is that the bottom function always has to be positive. He's underneath a square root sign. There's no way he's ever going to produce a negative value, right? But the 4 minus 8 ninths x squared is an upside down parabola. So he'll go minus, plus, and then minus, which means this <coughs> This is the value that will maximize my function. Now, on the interval, negative 3 to 3, right? Because that's what we're looking at, negative 3 to 3. This value is the only relative maximum. And it's a pretty good bet that he's not going to be smaller than one of the endpoints, especially 3, because you're decreasing until 3. Now, this negative 3 has a shot at being, uh, at, being a maximum, uh, at being a maximum value as well. However, if you look at the graph, right? If you, if you made the point all the way out here, the rectangle would be super thin. So I don't know if that would work. So from here, we know that at, at x equals 3 over rad 2, we have a maximum. So let's find out what y is when that happens. Well, y, I'll go and plug him into, where is that y function? Where did he escape to? Right there. So I know that it's 3 over rad 2. So I know that y equals the square root of 4 minus 4 ninths parentheses 3 over rad 2 squared. So that's 4 minus 4 ninths times 9 over 2. And that's all underneath the square root. So that's going to cancel out. That's going to kind of cancel. So here. 4 minus rad 2 is going to be, oh, 4 minus 2 is going to be y equaling rad 2. So now the area that makes this happen is going to be 4 parentheses xy, right? So that was 3 over rad 2 times rad 2. The rad 2s cancel, and you end up with 12 as your answer. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on to the next problem. In problem 71, it reads, a particle moves along the x-axis so that at any time t being greater than 0, its position is given by this function here, x of t equaling t cubed minus 3, t squared minus 9t plus 1. It asks us for what values of t is the particle at rest? Well, from here, to find out when the particle's at rest, we need to know how the particle is moving. For that, we need a derivative. And the derivative of position is velocity. And that's going to be 3t squared minus 6t minus 9. So I want to find out when this guy's at rest, so mo when my velocity is 0. As I bring down my derivative, I'm going to divide everything by 3 since they're all divisible. t squared minus 2t minus 3. And at this point, this is an over-glorified integrated 2 problem. So t looks like minus 3, t plus 1. 
So in this case, t would be three or negative one. However, since they specified t being greater than or equal to zero, I think this guy is out. So I'm pretty sure it's just at t equaling three. So pretty straightforward problem there, particle motion. You guys will deal with a different kind of particle motion in calculus BC when the particle moves via x and y simultaneously. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we will get there when we get there. The last problem I'm going to do is problem 79. It reads the absolute maximum value of f of x equaling x cubed minus 3x squared plus 12. And they give me an interval of negative 2 to 4. And we have to figure out what the absolute maximum value is. So absolute min and max means we, gotta com we have to consider the, uh, the critical numbers of the, of the derivative as well as the endpoints and plug them back into the original to find out how high this thing actually goes. So f prime of x is going to be 3x squared minus 6x. So from here, the 12 goes away, which is good. I'm going to factor out a 3x on GCF. I get x minus 2, which means x will either equal 0 or 2, which means my candidates for an absolute max will be f of negative 2, f of 0, my critical number, f of 2, the other critical number, and f of 4, the other endpoint. So I just got to manually plug these dudes in and figure out which one's the biggest. So negative 2 cubed minus 3 times negative 2 squared plus 12. Looks like negative 8. Careful, this is going to become a 4. So minus 12 plus 12, that gets me negative 8. 0, thank goodness for 0, because he just gets me 12. So this guy's obviously out. f of 2, 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 squared plus 12. That's 8 minus, what is that, uh, 4, so 8 minus 12 plus 12, so I'm getting 8. And then 4 is going to be 4 cubed minus 3 times 4 squared plus 12. So I'm looking at 64 minus 16 times 3 is 48 plus 12. So 64 minus 48 is going to be 24 plus 12, so that's going to be 36. So I believe 36 is the greatest uh, value, which happens at x equals 4. And I believe that will wrap up this video on derivative applications. So I tried to hit as many of the topics as I could with linear approximation, a related rate, optimization, a particle problem, as well as an absolute min-max problem. Of course, there are other uh, versions of these derivative applications, more optimization, more related rates, but we'll get to them when we get to them. Uh, as always, please leave comments or questions in the comments area. I will see you all in the next episode.